I will talk to you today about um, the construction of uh, fashion within the philosophical discourse of the 19th and 20th uh, century. Right? So I will go through different instances and through different authors. So I won't talk about fashion proper in that sense. I won't talk about, I won't analyze the dress. I won't analyze uh, a house. I won't analyze any specific designers, nor will I analyze the economic dynamics or whatever of fashion or the sociology of fashion. But I would just rather go into, you can say it's a, it's, it's a topic on discourse. How is fashion constructed within uh, the philosophical uh, field of the 19th and 20th century. Yeah? Alors, from Jean-Jacques Rousseau to Friedrich Nietzsche, from Thorstein Veblen to Simone de Beauvoir, philosophers who have written on fashion have stigmatized it as the other of the West, namely as Oriental. According to the anti-monarchal republican ideology of the modern, the empire of fashion is constructed as an inner orient that is to be discarded or eradicated if possible. <coughs> the tropes that constitute the inner orient stem from a well-known topic in the history of ideas, namely the Oriental Renaissance. The Oriental Renaissance was, was a big kind of uh, philosophical, philological <coughs> movement that explored, um, the Orient was a very wide topic, everything from Sanskrit, India, uh, Japan, China, uh, Hebrew languages, uh, Arabic languages, Semitic languages, and so on and so forth, right? So the Orient was just uh, everything that was not Western, basically, right? And the Oriental Renaissance, a, a philological and philosophical movement of the, um, of the 18th and 19th century uh, has, has had a very profound influence on uh, the, the Western tra tradition of uh, how we think about ourselves and how we think about uh, the other, and uh, ha has therefore had a very strong influence also on, on the construction of uh, fashion. Within the ideology of modernity, the effeminate and the idolatrous, decadent and ruinous cult of fashion has to be eradicated for progress to march on. An egalitarian male republic, thus the political agenda against fashion, can be realized only once the stumbling block of fashion is out of the way. In the following, I do not support the attitude the I do not support the attitude against the inner orient, since fashion is an essential ingredient, I think, of public life as well as private self-esteem. It is a media through which we articulate uh, our conflicts, uh, both the, the gender conflicts as well as the class conflicts. And its oriental appearance is a mark of civil freedom rather than of individual subject subjection. To denounce fashion is part of a dark heritage of modernity that belongs to a negative dialectics of enlightened societies in which the misguided sexual politics of a male-dominated republicanism react against the threat of female volatility. The susceptibility of women to fall for an oriental dream has accompanied Western culture, and thus the effemination of men who are attracted to them, has accompanied Western culture since Caesar and Anthony fell for Cleopatra. Fashion's openness to foreign ornament eternalized the attraction, but also embodied the threat. Consequently, I shall not address any Oriental influences on fashion, nor shall I discuss the fashion of Orientalism. I hope you know about that. Poiré, I mean, the whole birth of uh, fashion was closely linked to Oriental uh, influences. If you look, for example, now there is an exhibition at, uh, at the Musée Yves Saint Laurent à Paris where you can see all the Chinese, all the, all the uh, uh, Japanese, all these influences on fashion. But that's not my topic today. I will use instead the concept of the inner Orient in order to modify the thesis of Edward Said's Orientalism, 
a book intended to revise and reset public opinion towards the Orient, but limited in the analysis of its many implications. The West, Said argued, projects all things threatening, namely effeminacy, emasculation, inertia, tyranny, decadence, onto some outer other called the Orient in order to consolidate its own identity. I argue instead that the West installs within its reformed Protestant or Republican discourses an inner Orient, which pretends in its very heart a menacing Orient that undoes from within all things properly Western, i.e. natural sexuality to begin with, and consequently patriarchy, self-determination, self-control, progress, and thus any meaningful sense of history. The concept of the inner Orient became current in the 19th century when it was the Catholic Church that was stigmatized as Oriental by German Protestants and French, and also some Italian Republicans alike. That is, the Catholic Church was stigmatized as a perverse, a sterile, a decadent, an addictive, a monstrous, uh, an, an effeminate idolatry. Effeminate and effeminizing, we might even say. A striking example of this Republican, of this discourse formation is Emile Zola's trilogie Trois Villes, which was written between 1993 and 1998, in which a Babylonian Lourdes, which as you might know is the most successful place of the apparition of Mary uh, in, in France. So in this Trois Villes, in, Trois Villes in which a Babylonian Lourdes and a decadent Rome, evidently as the, as the heart of the Catholic Church and the seat of the popes, are overcome by a secular, vitalist Republican Paris as the new Jerusalem. Three days are called Lourdes, Rome, Paris, and you see evidently that there is progress made and that we go into the, the right direction. Anti-fashion discourse that casts fashion as an oriental colony in the heart of the West, namely Paris, evolved with the Enlightenment. In, which, in what follows, I shall investigate the modernist Republican rejection of fashion, whose dominant discourses stigmatized fashion as the devastating, corrupting, effeminate, oriental other. The authors of this monotonous narrative crafted by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, remodeled effectively by Friedrich Nietzsche and Emile Zola, and starring theoreticians like Thorstein Veblen, Adolf Loos, Werner Sombach, Simone de Beauvoir, and Pierre Bourdieu, have anonymously predicted, hoped for, and expected fashion's end. Fashion had to be overcome for in, on the modern way into a brighter and a healthier future at that. For all these philosophers and writers, the twilight of fashion was necessary for a free, democratic, enlightened, and egalitarian republic to thrive. The political and aesthetic norm that modernists in general and Republicans in particular strove for is, strove for is manifest in ideas from the straight man and plain speech to maxims like form follows function, ornament is a crime, and less is more. It is diametrically opposed to what is regarded as revolting in fashion as an oriental, decadent, tyrannical, effeminate, and in short, perverse threat. According to dominant philosophical discourses, the empire of fashion threatens to ruin republican achievements Republican achievements such as, first of all, male virtue, 
followed by the equality of the sexes and rational choice, that is, the self-determined de self and self-controlled autonomous subject as such, the narratives, in short, we all know, the narratives of progress. Interesting that anti-fashion stance includes even, and in particular, the avant-garde of aesthetics. As a cyclical return of the same under the name of the new, fashion was something to be overcome and turned into progress. Dominated by fetishism, fashion supposedly led to addictive consumerism, reducing free men to their basic instincts and turning women into commodities on the marriage and sex markets, subject to the alienating rule of reification. Fashion is denounced in Republican discourse, a discourse I think that one should analyze instead of take for granted, as the brave and the free tend to do, as that which will convert women into slaves. It is feared that men in turn will be turned into the slaves of fashion's ravishing artificial idols. The authors on whom I shall focus in the following all resisted fashion seduction with a stern reform for the good of the republic of free men to come to be achieved. In 1768, Rousseau presents pre-revolutionary Paris as a fascinating, though corrupt, new Babel whose sign of corruption was fashion. In Rousseau's view, fashion, and now I put this into my words, was a queering force, since it undoes everything, first of all the most natural of all natural things, namely the division of the sexes. Here comes Rousseau. Unable to make themselves into men, women make us into women. Unable to, turn to, to become themselves men, women turn us into women turn us into women, Rousseau wrote. Fashion is for, and this is for Rousseau, this is synonymous with Parisian fashion, perverts natural sexuality and is a symptom of feudal decadence. Disfiguration and not perfectibility is fashion's driving force in Rousseau's view. The artificer fashion perverts the natural order of the sexes and classes, turns and turns aristocratic ladies into whores. Wonderful quotation from Rousseau. Those, thus, they cease to be women out of fear of being confounded with other women, prefer, preferring their rank to their sex. They imitate whores so as not to be imitated. This is the aristocratic ladies. So it turns aristocratic ladies into whores, women into men, which you've just heard, and most perversely, it effeminates men. At the end of the day, fashion undoes all virtue, which is virtue, men, no? male, male quality, the basis of republican concern. The Parisian aristocratic salon society is, in Rousseau's view, an oriental harem, headed not by a sultan, but much worse, by a lady. And I quote again from uh, Rousseau. And every woman in Paris gathers in her apartment a harem of men, more womanish than she is. The effeminate rules in erotic, idol idolatrous cults dominating Paris. They reduce men to eunuchs, to toy boys performing at the mistress's command. Under the spell of fashion, Paris is conceived by Rousseau as an artificial, namely an oriental, space opposed to the natural, the austere, the patriarchal home of the pure republic of Geneva. Paris is the opposite of Rousseau's political idea, ideal, the anti-space of Cato's virtuous Roman Republic. Parisian eras, on the other hand, rules tyrannically through fashion. It ruins virtus, manhood, and with virtue, it ruins everything straight and proper. 
For the virtuous republic to come, fashion, Rousseau suggests, had to be abolished. It had to be overcome. It had to be the twilight of fashion. Something else had uh, to happen. Now I turn from uh, Rousseau to Nietzsche and we jump in the centuries. We jump to 1878 and I turn to one specific aphorism by Nietzsche in Human All to Human, a book for free uh, spirits. I mean, everybody is always surprised that all the philosophers talk about fashion, but they do in fact they do all talk about fashion, <laughs> be it only to cast it as uh, this uh, inner orient. Nietzsche, in any event, in, this, in, this, in these aphorisms of human all to human, uh, adores and promotes the ideal modern republican garment. And he puts it right before our eyes. And what is this ideal uh, republican a garment Rousseau might have dreamt of, it is of course the male suit. The fragment 215, which is titled Fashion and Modernity, is a fervent apology for the male suit and a stark condemnation of all things fashionable. And fashion is here already clearly associated with uh, uh, feminine fashion, which I think it is still today, right? When men are not fashionable, women are fashionable. Nietzsche brilliantly illustrates and endorses the ide ideology of the male suit as cornerstone of the modernist political and aesthetic ideology par excellence. In this short fragment, he takes the decisive break, the great French Revolution of 1789, for a historic a priori in the order of clothes. Mm. If you are into fashion theory, it, it, is, it is always the question, uh, uh, what is the, 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 the main opposition that structures fashion, if you talk within structuralist terms. And most of the people agree that the great break came around the French Revolution, that is around, with a change from a feudal aristocratic monarchical system to a uh, republican system with its ups. Uh, and dance. And John Karl Flügel, the, um, the uh, Viennese who then went to London, uh, first psychoanalysis of clothes, we could say, has called this break, which came about uh, in the order of fashion through the French Revolution, he has named that the great male renunciation. Mm. And this is, I think, what Nietzsche thinks is the, the hallmark of the timely modern politics of fashion, right? This great male uh, renunciation. Um, the modern male suit is the negative of the feudal attire of the arist aristocrat to whom clothes were everything. The new bourgeois man has nothing of the male culture. The bourgeois shows in his clothes that he has more important things on his mind than clothes. He, it is elementary to remember that, here it is elementary to remember that before the French Revolution, it was aristocratic men who were the beautiful sex. Right? I mean, if you think of all the paintings uh, of aristocratic men, and I think of uh, the famous Rigaud painting of uh, Louis XIV, where, uh, where you see his incredibly beautiful legs of a ballet dancer in white, gleaming silk stockings. You see all the paraphernalia of the attires of power. But not only that, I think that men, men, I mean, and you have, you certainly see this in front of your eyes, men were super colorful, they were superbly adorned, they spotted uh, lace, great lace, uh, great finery, incredible embroidery. So the men were in their clothing more uh, ornated and more, um, how should I put this? Let's say ornated, right? I mean, more colorful, more, more sexy also, because you could see their whole legs, you could see their butt. Uh, they they overemphasized their genitals, right? And so, so they were the the more impressive, you could say, the more the more sexy and the more beautiful, the more adorned, um, the more adorned a sex. Um, and and I think this, this contrast of the, of the suit, which kind of covers over the male body, right? And kind of, it's gray, it's gray on gray. There are, there's only one colorful emblem, namely the cravat, mm, the tie. 
and it kind of unifies, and by unifying the body also kind of uh, de-emphasizes the body and, and puts, doesn't let it to be seen, whereas from there on it is only the female body in its forms, in its silhouette, in colors that is, uh, that, that, that wears the beauty and the, the sex, the, the eroticism, we could say, clothes can, uh, can bestow on us. Mm. So before the French Revolution, the men, and specifically the, uh, the, the, cl the clerical men and the aristocratic men, dressed in full ornate, right? We say invested in the ornation of the priest and so on and so forth. The aristocracy dressed, dressed sorry, lavishly, while neither men nor women of the third estate sported silk, lace, velvet, feathers, or colors. After the revolution, so you have a, the, the basic opposition is that of uh, classes or that of estates, actually, right before the revolution. And after the revolution, the clothes no longer separate the estates, but they rather separate uh, the sexes. Fashion became synonymous with the feminine or rather the effeminate. Only women distinguished themselves through their clothes. They indulged in adornment and displayed a beautiful body. In their fashioned women, one might therefore say, the bourgeoisie displayed the castration of the aristocracy, right? Because at the same time that they became the more beautiful, the, the more beautiful sex, they also became a totally powerless a sex, and they were casted as women of the heart, or what do I not know? Yeah, so they were casted within this castrative mood, the castration that the aristocrat aristocracy had to was subjected to. Now the suit, to come back to my all favorite uh, piece here, now the suit was for Nietzsche the essence of fashion in modernity because precisely it eliminates everything fashionable. Re-evaluating -evalu re all values, Nietzsche radically defines fashion. Its true character, Nietzsche tells us, is not change, forget it, but solid constancy. It is not about vanity, or the desire to stand out in empty, superficial appearances. For Nietzsche, surprisingly so, fashion should not distinguish, but it should equalize. The male suit, wool cloth, muted, dark colors, loose cut, no play between fabric and body, carefully constructed, no revealing or clinging, fashions in Nietzsche's account the civil, the intellectual body politic of modern society. To dress modern means by now, and here I reformulate Nietzsche only slightly, to dress modern means by now to manage a rather paradoxical speech act, to be able, with your clothes, to communicate that you couldn't care less about clothes. The major, the major European, ideally an independent intellectual male, distinguishes himself as a Geistesmensch, that is, man of intellectual worth, not through his appearances, frivolous frills, but through vision and achievements, pretty much the same today. His character and individuality, his thought, and not his body or beauty are at stake. It is the indifference to anything commonly understood as fashionable that distinguishes a person of worth. The worn out misogynistic opposition of flesh, female, and intellect, male, of an effeminate attitude and sober manhood dominates Nietzsche's aphorism. If the male suit sublimates the body, female fashion shapes the seductive flesh. And it is here that the Orient that I started out with, the anachronistic, aris-dominated other of European sublimation and intellectual hypocrisy sneaks into Nietzsche's essay. If fashion, as Nietzsche meditates rather than demonstrates, has its unifying modern form in the suit, female fashion is bound to be exotically anachronistic and eclectic. There, Nietzsche writes, in female fashion, one has mastered the inventiveness of older feudal cultures and the whole orbit. 
the Spanish, the Turks, and old Greeks combined in order to put the beautiful flesh on stage. That is, incapable of creating a meaningful form to shape modernity and its republican body politic, body politic female fashion borrows indiscriminately from everywhere. Since what it aims for is nothing but the mise-en-scene of the beautiful flesh, it borrows from cultures not yet reformed and unfit for sublimation, not yet redeemed by modernity. Fashion masquerades in clothes of the court, namely the effeminate, the tyrannical Ancien Regime of Spanish influence, Andalusia was part of the Orient, of Turkish styling, Ottoman Empire, think Ottoman Empire, of the Orientalized Greeks, Cleopatra, and the Egyptian horror of all things feminine. A manierist arabesque, where you hear already the Orient, a potpourri, a dire return of a past one had hoped to leave behind in progress. Female fashion is thus the antithesis of all modern aims. The male suit, and thus Nietzsche's clear-sighted achievement, is the norm of modernity to which all clothes should conform. There are far-reaching consequences to be drawn from this position. Women and young idle men, young idle men and women, according to Nietzsche, both young idle men and women are unable and unwilling to distinguish themselves through their achievements, so they have to go for clothes, here you have the dandies. They must compensate intellectual emptiness by lavishing their efforts on their outer appearances. Stranded in another time, they have not yet arrived in modernity. But hope for the twilight of fashion should not be entirely abandoned. Once the ladies' men and also the ladies themselves have finally been educated to become modern Europeans, there will be no further false fashioning. It will have simply vanished. Now, after this kind of uh, uh, discourse, I turn to uh, Emile Zola, and I stay within the same century and even within the same um, decennie. Since, uh, and here we come to, to fiction, but the discourse within uh, the two is basically the same, although I think Zola gives it more power, if you wish. And when talking about Zola and fashion, I would like to talk about a novel that Zola is part of the Rougon Macquart and that Zola wrote in 83. It's called Au Bonheur des Dames, or, it is, or it's translated quite fittingly, I think, A Lady's Paradise. And here, Zola narrates fashion linked to mass consumption and the turbo capitalism of the Second Empire as a truly full-blown, tyrannical inner Orient. His novel, Au Bonheur des Dames, shows us the Paris of Napoleon III as a ruinous, as a decadent, as a hysterical tyranny, a new Babylon, in fact. A few traces of virtue are left, but they are very rare. I come to them later. Au bonheur des dames, as you might know when you do French uh, literature, fictional, fictionalizes one of the first department stores in Paris, a true monument of capitalist ambition, as a return of the old Babylonian cults, of flesh-consuming idols like Baal and Moloch, combined with the cult of Kybele. Here we see the very strong uh, influence of uh, the, the Oriental uh, Renaissance. If you think of Kreutzer, yeah, who, who described all these, who rediscovered and described all these uh, cults. And the, the, the department store uh, Zola kind of synthesizes is Au Bonheur des Dames, Boukiko, the found, uh, no, it's, pardon, uh, Le Bon Marché, uh, which was founded by Boukiko, and Les Galeries Lafayette. So it's kind of a subtract of, these, of the development of these two uh, uh, department stores. Department stores for, the, for Zola are the cathedrals of the empire of capitalism. The novel describes modern consumerism as a Catholic Oriental decadent cult of temple prostitution. Both department stores and medieval cathedrals are presented by Zola as women's houses. 
brothels appropri appropri appropriately called Notre Dame, Notre Dame de Paris, eh, hein? or close enough, Au Bonheur des Dames. In that store, a luxurious bazaar, women are dancing around the golden calf and indulge in orgies of shameless vice. Their shopping is here depicted as the modern version of a temple, of the temple prostitution, which was practiced, people think, in the cults of uh, uh, Kibele. After a day of sales, sales, the department store looks as if they had ruthlessly undressed on the spot, stripped off their clothes in an attack of neurotic desire. Uh, if you think of something like that, you can think nowadays uh, in New York, for example, Barney's warehouse sale or something. Eh? Ravished, they bathe in the caresses of public offers and are themselves offered to the public, pale with desire. And I quote uh, Zola, the clients, which is the, girl, uh, the women, raped, violated, plundered, went away, half undressed. They felt the faint shame having made love in a fishy motel. The department store, I mean, fishy motel is me, but uh, the English translation didn't get the, didn't get the, the point of uh, brothel and uh, making love. The department store is thus depicted as a cannibalistic baal whose trembling energy comes from devouring flesh. The store owner is a bloodsucker who drinks the blood of women and sells their flesh like a Jew. And this is, of course, the most pertinent figure of the Inner Orient. And you could also say an enduring memory of Shylock in the 19th century. So he sells their flesh like a Jew by the pound. The temples of modern consumption have enshrined the cult of female flesh, which women's all-consuming desire to consume incorporates. Femininity and money have become interchangeable. Universalized prostitution, the great whore Babylon, is capitalism's underlying metaphor and the universal moral of the last novel. Zula criticizes modern consumer culture and its desire for clothes, ever more fashionable clothes, against the backdrop of sacrificial oriental cults. Baal, Moloch, and the phallic cults of the great mother, Kibele. He models the cataracts of silk, the waterfalls of Georgette, and the pool they form where women adoringly dream of an artificially fashioned, perfected femininity on the sources of the Adonis River, described by Ernest Renan in his Mission de Finissie of 1864, which I think when I, when I stumbled upon this, I was, as a philologist, totally uh, stricken that he really took this, this description by Renan, his oriental, the, orient, the oriental mission uh, by Renan, to transpose that into the silk cataracts, into the Georgette cataracts within uh, uh, the, the Bonheur des Dames. In this description of, uh, of Renan, there is opposite the source of the mythic Greek Adonis River, uh, there was a Venus temple, a place it was thought of temple prostitution. This is what Renan tells uh, in the story, and the department store, the spectacle of feminine self-fashioning in Zola's novels is like an ancient temple of Venus, at once cathedral, brothel, and bazaar, modeled on the most telling source of all things oriental, namely the source of the Adonis. There, at the primordial Greek source, sex and gold have become exchangeable and taken on the oriental sign under which femininity becomes a commodity and commodity the idea of the feminine. Thus, you could say a dialectics of enlightenment, to quote uh, Horkheimer or Adorno, comes true and is fulfilled as the threat of fashion. According to 19th century narratives like Zola's novel, with the global triumph of capitalism in its imperial shape at hand, Modernity was clearly not on a civilizing mission in the Orient. It is rather the Orient that, that triumphs in the innermost heart 
of modernity in Paris, the capital, to quote Benjamin, of the 19th century. It is not France, as it were, that conquered the colonies. The colonies, rather, took over France. The colonies are not reformed in the rational spirit of the Enlightenment. Rather, empire shines in the glaring light of the resurfing Oriental idolatry. The virtuous republic vanished without a trace, has vanished without a trace and had to be founded again by a new reformed saint. And the woman who is not touched by femininity and who has nothing about it that is effeminate is uh, properly named Denise. And as you, as you might remember, Saint Denis is of course the founding patron saint of, uh, of Paris. Right? So here comes out of this glaring Moloch, finally comes out a new, uh, a new saint that will refound this republic on a sound all male, I mean, true love basis. And it's so funny, I think, that, uh, that, that Zola still builds that uh, within the founding saint of uh, Paris. Now, now we jump the ocean, that is, we jump with uh, Torstein Weber the ocean from Norway to, uh, to the East Coast, and we come, we stay within the 19th century, and uh, we come to Yale and later, yeah, to the, to the East Coast. Now, at the end of the 19th century, Torstein Feblen, whose immigrant parents came from a thoroughly reformed Norway, wrote an update of the harshest and most influential condemnations of fashion. And this was, of course, the theory of the leisure class. Now, according to this theory of the leisure class, fashion is again, and in the most pointed, revealing manner, a feudal, an oriental anachronism that must be left behind on the way into an emancipated, self-determined and democratic future. Clearly, Fablin is on a mission here with a historically, sociolo sociologically, analytically strengthened argument against what he casts as tyrannical, idolatrous, barbaric fashion. He positions the leisure class of the money as aristocracy um, in parallel with the aristocracy of the French Ancien Regime. So, you, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, okay. The society described by Feblen, this is the, 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 the society of the, of the US at the end of the 19th century, the society, like James, for example, the society described by Feblen is far more, is far from being an egalitarian Republican society of free men, which of course it hoped to be. In spite of the fact that the leisure class, that the leisure of that class owes its riches to the capitalistic principle of money making money, like still today, this caste remains for, for Feblen a feudal relic. Like the older aristocracy, these people do not work but spend ostentatiously to represent their wealth in the public eye. Well, this is what is meant by leisure class. For the, for the leisure class on which fashion and its development seem to depend now, fashion is a form of, of serfdom inflicted on their women and their servants. While the men of this class exhibit the, la the labor, the exploitation and subjugation of their servants, an activity that keeps them well dressed, Fiblin points out in snow white, carefully ironed shirts and polished patent leather shoes, they remain nonetheless the masters of a labor they do not perform, their bodies unconstrained. Their wives and their servants have to expose their subjection. In the liveries of servants, frocks of priests and corsets of wives, their bondage is evident. Subjugated to their masters, their flesh is marked with the insignia of domination. As property, serfs and slaves are deprived of free mo movement. In the very heart of modernity, Fierblin's argument goes, the mechanisms of subjugation are the same as in a monarchy, which knows subjects, sujet, but not free men. Even worse, these are like primitive savages who appear as the radical other of an enlightened 
rational modernity. The example uh, Feblin gives, and this is not totally up to date, day because he talks of the captain of industry who parades his trophy wife on Fifth Avenue, and today it would clearly be Madison Avenue, right? Nobody would, would parade his trophy wife on Fifth Avenue. And, and uh, Feblin says, the, ca the captain of industry acts like the Indian Kwakutl chief who carries his trophies in a triumph. Fieblin describes conspicuous consumption, the motor of modern capitalism, as a wild, a barbaric, an uncivilized, a decadent practice dominated by reification and fetishism. This barbaric underside of modernity, which tyrannically enslaves and forces the subjected to wear the stigmata of serfdom on their flesh, like the slaves of the ancient world. Remember, the slaves and the horse were, were truly stigmatized in antiquity, right? They were marked within the flesh of the signs of being prostitutes or slaves or whatever. Now, Feblin argues that in modernity, uh, through fashion, uh, like the serfs of the feudal age, and now like the wives of capitalist patriarchy, we have to bear uh, these uh, marks of subjection on our very uh, bodies, and the example he gives for this kind of mark of subjection we have to wear, we the women, I mean the wives of the cabin, have to wear in our very body, are the bound feet of the, arist uh, first of all the corset of course, but secondly the bound feet of the aristocratic Chinese ladies. Fieblin collects enemies, again of course another orientalism, Feblin, you might say, collects enemies, and these enemies of the projected republic of equal, free, and self-determined people are a strange mix. The Catholic Church, to begin with, the feudal Middle Ages accordingly, and the perverse, tyrannical Oriental world in general, including ancient slavery and pre-modern savages. In short, all enemies who resist reform and reformation. Here, the bound feet of the Chinese aristocratic ladies are of emblematic signif significance in that they tie together both barbaric origins and decadence, right? So the, I think this is a very interesting example. But things, I said, are in no way better in Feblin's contemporary United States. The female bound feet are to Chinese men what female corsets and high heels are to American men. They are crippling barbaric stigmata that bring distinction. Men look at their wives, according to Veblen, not for erotic thrills, but in order to distinguish themselves through their wives' reification and commodification. In a patriarchal society, women's function consists in demonstrating the credibility of the household of conspicuous consumption. In, in Zola also there's this famous scene where in La, Don, uh, for the, uh, the, the La Denrée, uh, the, the wife of the mogul, the immobilia mogul, walks down the stairs in a dress by Worth. It's like a, it's like a silk dress only. It, it is nude. The color is nude. She, she looks like a naked statue. He, he, his, his uh, stock market is totally down and out. And once all Paris sees uh, René coming down the stairs in this dress of worth, the next time his stocks go up again and he is uh, saved. So that is that the, 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 re the reified women uh, kind of demonstrates the credibility of the household through her conspicuous mm, consumption. By no means superfluous, as it seems at first sight, that is, of course, the most utilitarian and the most successful thing to do. The faster a fashion changes, the more ostentatious it is, the more a man of means can show these means by means of his wife. Demonstrating his power, she leads a light of luxury and leisure in the public eye. As the first servant of the house, she is part of his mobile good, like a Maserati, like luxury yacht. As a reified status symbol, she usually even enjoys, as Simone de Beauvoir shall later put it, her self-reification and alienation. In spite of and beside all these modes of tight subjugation in dire need of reform, there remains a bizarre phenomenon for Feblen and his disciples, a strange desire of some men, whom Feblen dismisses as 
effeminate. To wear like fashionable women and to enjoy that uncomfortable, unmanly clothes. He fears, Fabian fears, that not only women, priests and servants, but also homosexual men, and here you have the usual subjects again, will never become the emancipated, self-determined subjects the free republic of man depends upon. Now we come closer to home and we go to Vienna and we go 10 years, a little bit later, 10 or 15 years later, we go behind, we go after the turn of the century and we come to Adolf Loos, who, you might have read that, decries female fashion as the most, quote, disgraceful chapter in the history of civilization. Like Nietzsche, a fan of the male suit as the ideal garment of Republican freedom, Loos sees female fashion as a violation of almost every rule of modern aesthetic ideology. Overtly ornamental, he calls fashion simply a crime. As a forerunner of the Neue Sachlichkeit movement, Loos is a decisive authority in formulating the new and finally modern aesthetic ideal that may, that may be reconciled and go hand in hand with the political ideal. For him again, female fashion enslaves men and women alike. I think it's important, the, the, the thing of slave, of tyranny, right? And this, and this as the oriental metaphor per se uh, is, is, is important here. No free society, no equality, no virtue seems possible as long as women have to adorn themselves and reduce themselves to the merchandise of a marriage or the sex market. Shamelessly, fashion seems to appeal to the beast in men. Where Fabian saw socio-political reasons to do away with fashion, Loos recedes to natural grounds upon which the decadent culture of his time no longer allows a healthy sexuality. And it's very funny because Lewis says, otherwise, you know, all humans would simply go naked. And thus you find here the oldest of links dating from Paradise Lost, of fashion to sin and after the fall to perverted uh, sexuality, right? I mean, you remember that first Adam and Eve were of course naked and then, okay. Lewis's conclusion, however, of what to do about the aesthetic and moral misery of modern sexual politics is quite remarkable. Without the right, the right to self-determined work, women is condemned to remain a creature of pleasure. So Lewis is truly a fervent uh, feminist. As long as women, Lewis writes, cannot compete with men but have to compete for men, attempts to reform fashion according to adequate aesthetic principles are doomed. If, dis if distinction is the motor of male fashion, female fashion depends only on the changing sexual male tastes. And this is why we have the models, I mean the female fashion, going from masochism to pedophilia, from the dominatrix to the child woman, right? I mean, all the types of fashionable uh, femininity. With women dressed up as decoys, female fashion has to meet the eye at any cost. Within patriarchal capitalism, Loos and Feblin are, agree, women are subjected, serving prestige and serving, and I think serving here is key, serving lust. As feudal relics, they go like all servants high and low, the priests subjected to God, the king servant of the realm, the soldiers serving the country, they go like all these servants, quote, in gold, velvet, and silk adorned or rather stigmatized with bows, frills, and feathers. Women can only embark on their voyage into modernity once they have left behind and erased the oriental signature of the ornamental arabesque that is the aesthetic mark of fashion. Women have to learn the ABC of modernity that men have learned by heart, i.e. form follows function, less is more, and thus, Lowe's probably most famous quote, Ornament is something that must be overcome. Only with her dress reformed does women have a chance to be more than a feather in his cap. When talking about female emancipation, Lois gets almost lyrical. I think I really like that. It's really... Only then can she emancipate herself from servile beguiling and become a self-determined subject in a free society. 
In contrast to Loos jumping to such happy conclusions, it was Werner Sombach, too, at about the time in 1913, restated the basic oriental metaphor that continued to inform philosophical discourses on fashion. The harem as perversion of free natural sexuality with its dialectics of master and slave, but also and nevertheless with its reification and alienation of women as object, objects of lust. However, in spite of his rather one-dimensional all-over thesis, Zombat comes up, I think, with a kind of interesting historical twist. Uh, twist. Capitalism, modern consumer society, Zombat thinks, cannot thrive in a patriarchy based on marriage. Both capitalism and uh, consumer society depend on free love. Uh, free love here meaning des maîtresses et des petits maîtres. The luxury industry, and there's also fashion, boomed because in Europe love happened mostly, almost as a rule, outside of marriage and free of institutional fetters. What drives the industry is neither vanity nor pride for Zombart, but the cult of all things feminine, and he calls this the total triumph of the familet. Now in English there isn't a word for the familet, uh, nor for the weibchen, um, and so I translated it with paramour. The paramour who reigned well into the 19th century forged the taste of their lovers and made them spend lav lavishly on their behalf. Without free love, with love beyond the institution of marriage, no blooming luxury industries. In the end, beyond the fight over free love versus institutional restraint, the freedom of love comes for some Zombart under the signature of an oriental way of life as the after image of an effeminate monarchy in a tamed, enclosed, even foreclosed fashion, you might say. And there's something reassuring about it because it cannot, or rather shall not anymore, corrupt free men, enlightened subjects, and it does not effeminate the true upright men, but only a decadent monarch. The inner orient for Zambart lies in the past. It has lost its threat, is nothing but an arabesque left behind in the progress of free men. This is because Zombart uh, describes this, this, the very epitome of free love fittingly and we might almost say emblematically uh, in the castle of Lucien. I don't know whether you know that. This is the love nest that, the love nest, Zombart would say, that Louis, uh, Louis XV has built for his uh, maîtresse en titre, uh, Madame Dubarry. And he has built Louvcienne as a Turkish fantasy in which the king, subjected to the whims of the mistress of the realm, reigned, Zombat writes, as a marionette sultan. Très joli, c'était très, très heureux quand j'ai trouvé ça. The discourse of modernity, the hope for free men and women, for the upright and straightforward men, for plain speech, persists. And now I come to my last example, and we jump into the, not into the 21, but into the 20th century, and we come to Pierre Bourdieu, who was the master sociologist probably of the day. And Bourdieu uh, does not embark upon the per perilous topic of fashion is after all a women's topic and therefore there's always a transvestite writing when men write, as Hegel says, when men write on fashion, there's always the transvestism involved. So Bourdieu, very smart, uh, takes the expertise of a co-author, a woman co-author, Yvette Delso. Our spatial practice, Bourdieu and Delso argue, shows the same misconception and the same superstition that the West is ascribes to the decadent Orient, to the no less idolatrous Catholic Church, and to the barbaric savages. For Bourdieu, fashion is the foremost example of this misconception. As you know, fetishism is a kind of misconception, right? Delso and Bourdieu's example of, fetish, of fetishization within the realm of fashion is the designer's griff. 
the brand name which guarantees, he thinks, the exorbitant price. Bourdieu and Delso, they do not, do not see the grief as the guarantee of an artistic and aesthetic know-how and value, which you could also think, right? You could think Chanel guarantees a certain quality. Right? It is rather the mark of a fetish. The brand and not the dress carries the magic. Its attraction is performed through some kind of voodoo capitalistic cult on the market. It is like, Baudieu writes, a miraculous transubstantiation, and they just invoke once more the Catholic Church as the inner orient of modernism and in association with fetishism and superstition. Again, fashion appears as a dance around the golden calf, this time late capitalisms. The latest version of idolatry critique, which has in Bourdieu its ablest, pro its ablest propagator, direly, I think, needs to be dispelled by a different kind of analysis, an analysis aware of aesthetic aspects and political implications beyond the positivistic limitations and restrictions of mere social research. As a weird and incommensurable queering force, fashion needs to be read as a politics against the politics of plain speech, as a politics against the vicissitudes of functionalism, against Rousseau's phantom of virtuous, free, or republican maleness. In the last instance, fashion is indeed, and should finally be understood, as a politics against the politics of the modern, and the hypocrisy of the free subject. Fortunately, with fashion, we have never come fully around to the male phantom of politics. And this, this may be the best a future history has to say about us. Thank you. <laughs>